Hello, I, I'm back and as you can tell from the thumbnail, the, the title of the video, I'm not going to be talking about attraction design specifically, it might come up um, in, a, in a wee bit, but there was something that recently has come up that uh, I was talking to a couple of my friends around and I have been playing a couple of games recently where it's kind of come up back, back into my mind again and I just wanted to shoot something just get talking it's a it's a particular topic I'm really interested in I wrote about it uh, for one of the papers that I wrote when I was in um, my master's program at university and it's about uh, representing subcultures or culture um, authentically in media now I think automatically people will have uh, certain examples pop up into their heads um, and they uh, I think there's there's lots of different ways that this can be done and there's lots of different types of media that you can point to good examples of, bad examples of. But I think what I wanted to really talk about was ways in which that it's been portrayed that I think we can kind of take a deeper look at and understand why it works specifically. I think um, it's easy to point to a subculture represented in a certain type of media and go, oh, that's really great. But if you're not part of that subculture or if you don't really have a deeper understanding of how it originated, why it's so big, why people are drawn to it. A lot of the time people can kind of be drawn to the aesthetic components that are fed out into mainstream culture uh, and usually the vehicles for that are things like consumerism and capitalism and these uh types of aesthetics that you can buy into uh, and it's not necessarily authentic to the heart of, of, of what um, the subculture is about or or why it came about. Um, that's a lot of preamble, I get it. I'll, I'll go into some examples of what the hell I'm talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, one of the big ones uh, for me recently was I've been playing Fuser um, and if you're not aware, Fuser is Harmonix's new game. They made Rock Band and uh, Drop Mix and some other games that I'm blanking on. But basically, they, they make a lot of like rhythm games. So they make a lot of games about music, about music performance, about bringing those things into video game formats. And uh, usually through uh, kind of different ways of doing things, like peripherals. Like they'll make the guitars and the drums, like the physical peripherals that you use to interact with the game. Um so it's usually a very simple understanding of uh, the input, uh, the music that comes out of it, and and that's fairly simple, right? Like, it's it's just a game about music, so you pick up a guitar and you play the music and that's it. Um, but I think, and I'm going to talk about Fuser in a second, but I think with, with, with Harmonix's games versus, for example... Um, like the Guitar Hero games, which was at the time comparable, right? Like they were kind of seen as competitors in a lot of ways. You know, the Grand Theft Auto versus Saints Row, like they came around at the same time um, or they kind of influenced the other in different ways um, and they kind of had different uh, aspects to them that people were drawn to. But Guitar Hero versus Rock Band was a really interesting one for me um, because I always felt that Guitar Hero was a, a was a was a bad example of a music game versus rock band. Um, uh, hopefully I'll circle back to that in a minute, but some examples that I'm about to give, you'll you'll kind of understand where I'm coming at uh, from, from that point of view. So I was playing Fuser um, and it's all about being a DJ and playing to big crowds of people and mixing music. You get different samples, different uh, beats, different vocal samples, different... Uh, synth tracks and, and guitar tracks and everything and you in time with the music and in time with certain uh, things you you drop the music down you mix it up together and it gives you points based on how you do um, and it's, it's a very very simple premise uh, I think it's done fantastically well so far I have, I've only put a few hours into it but I'm, I'm really enjoying it for for a lot of reasons but I'll if I'm going to review the game I, I would make a separate video for that um, but what came up when I was playing it was I was trying to think, is this a love letter to DJing? Is this a love letter to that subculture of, of dance music, of samples, of mi music mixing, of music production, 
uh, festival culture because the, the whole game's set in, in uh, like a festival setting. Um, because when you start the game, you're immediately given a festival setting to to play in, and usually, particularly with rock band games, but usually of games of this kind of style, uh, Guitar Hero did the similar thing. You you start small. You that the thematically and narratively, you start you start in like a club. You play to a few people, and you have you know very little basic equipment, basic music, and you slowly work your way up. And you get more and more and bigger and bigger until you're playing festivals. But with Fuser, they made the decision to just start you at a festival. Which I thought was really bizarre when I started it. Um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be better if you started in a club? Like a small room, playing to a few people. And you would have that feeling of progression. That feeling of uh, growing as an artist. And and I was thinking about, well, why have they made the decision not to do that? And And to be honest, it could just be pragmatically, right? It could just be that they had finite resources to make the game and they thought, well, we can either make X amount of big festival, you know, art assets and visual assets and uh, and, and all that. Um, and we don't really have time to, to, to make a full story mode, you know, like little clubs and all that. So let's just focus on the festival thing. And so that got me thinking, well, if that is the reason they did that, then that's grand. But that... Uh, it feels like it's missing something to me. And then the second thought that came after that is, yeah, but I haven't been to a festival since 2000 and... <coughs> 2000 and... Um, and then on top of that, I'm not a... I've never been to a dance music festival. I've never been to a music... You, you know, the, the type of festivals I've been to are rock, pop, metal, th- those kind of settings. So how how do I know that this is not an authentic representation of that journey that a DJ would go on? You know, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of things uh, and, you know, it might be fair to assume these things, but if we're critiquing media, I think it's, I think you should be honest with, with your knowledge of, of things. And, and uh, it reminds me of when I had the reaction I had to uh, the Captain Marvel movie. I had a very negative reaction to it because I thought it didn't, uh, it, at the time, I thought it didn't represent uh, what I thought a lot of people were saying it represented, like for uh, for that character, for female empowerment, for that. That's what the film kind of stood for, right? At the time, um, or at least that was the that was what people were saying it stood for, because we're still in a time when we only have like two major. Uh, I think Black Widow's on the way, but you know there there are very few and far between. And I said, well, I didn't think that it portrayed that with this with the this the the screenplay. I thought the screenplay kind of uh, didn't make me as an audience member feel that 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 character was fully empowered. Same with Wonder Woman. I thought it, it, she seemed like a passenger in her own movie. But I was talking to a friend of mine, and she was saying, how can you have an authentic uh, opinion on that? when you are a man and you can't necessarily understand what how that empowerment was represented and how people feel that and how people who uh, identify as as a woman uh, or identify with that character if, from their background, how they feel about it. And that I still think about that quite often. Um, so I think when we're critiquing media, and lo- I mean, I think this can be portrayed in lots of different ways, but I think if you're critiquing media, you need to be honest about your own understanding of the things that you're talking about. If you try, if something is being portrayed as a real world thing, you know, you can watch a movie that is about a particular point in history from a different cult, uh, country. Um, but if you're not from that background, or if you don't, there, I'm not saying entirely that you don't know what you're talking about, but there will be holes um, about the artistic decisions that were made and your judgment of them, there isn't a full, not to, I'm not (laughs) saying that you can't review movies if you don't, you know, you can't talk about games if you don't know about the real world thing. But I think you should be honest, right? You should be authentic. And that kind of brings me to the crux of this whole uh, discussion that I wanted to have is when you're trying to represent a subculture, or represent a culture uh, in something that you're making. Authenticity should 100% be the thing that you're trying to uh, get across, right? Like, 
any subculture, any youth-based culture, any, I mean, to be honest, all parts of culture demand a certain level of authenticity for things to be deemed valuable, right? So if you look at, uh, for example, like the examples that was given about like rock band, rock band and Guitar Hero to me are an example of authenticity attempted versus authenticity not valued. So Rock Band attempts to have a certain level of authenticity with the visual design, the UI design, the the story progression, the narratives, the way that things are presented to you in that they admit things are dirty and grungy and, you know, you start off the game in a van and it it's not necessarily about empowerment at the beginning and you slowly get more of that power fantasy over time where you become like a big rock star, but you're not playing the big stages yet. And things like uh, like all the clothing that you buy at the beginning, all the cheap stuff, it's all got holes in it, it's non-branded, it's all just a bit uh it's all it's all a bit ripped up, right? But that's what draws people who like that style or people who like that lifestyle, who like that subculture of like DIY music making, um that's what draws them to it. There's an authenticity to it. There's a there's a, a realness to seeing someone not give a shit about polish at that early stage. That's usually musicians get a lot of shit after, once they have that big hit album. When they make the second album, they've got more money. The production value goes up, and then people go, "No, this doesn't sound like this doesn't sound like you." I mean, how many times has that like Biffy Clyro fans have? Uh, that's one in a million examples I could give, but it's the first one that came to mind. Biffy Clyro fans are constantly giving them shit. And, you know, like the new fans of the new style of music going, oh, well, that's not the real Biffy Clyro. That's not the authentic Biffy Clyro. You can, I'm sure there's a hundred million examples you can think of. Kings of Leon and, and all them. Um, Metallica is a, is a big one. Like production and authenticity are like a huge discussion as to metal fans in general. You know, they have their very strong opinions about their music and their representation and they're known actually <laughs> to me at least but i think metal fans are very gatekeepy i think all subcultures have gatekeepers and ultimately gatekeepers are trying to protect that authenticity or what they deem to be authentic um for better and for worse uh, for sure um so i think rock band does a good job of yes it's cartoony and yes it's it's uh, consumable but I think there's there was an attempt to kind of be uh, real with that culture. On the other hand, I think Guitar Hero is um, it's there's a lot of branding in those games, and there's a lot of like big name, you know, your it it to me it feels like the Jack Blackification of of you know they're saying oh it's a love letter to to glam rock it's a love re- love letter to to heavy metal and all this but then it's i think it was guitar Hero world tour literally has adverts in the game for pedals like uh distortion pedals and guitar pedals if, if i remember that correctly and they've got like you know uh, here's the drummer from red red hot chili peppers to sell you some products and you know all all of the there's loads and loads of branding and consumption stuff in there and it's all about this kind of rock and roll it it, none of it really fits for me it it feels like um a marketing team's attempt at at speaking to uh that crowd but i think if, if we're being honest guitar hero was never really about that it was more of a cartoony mainstream uh mainstream it was, it was playing to the mainstream right because they just wanted to shift units and they wanted to have use that certain aesthetic to uh sell units and that's perfectly fine and to be honest i love guitar hero uh guitar hero 3 in particular was uh, 2 and 3 were, were both amazing like super super fun so it's not i'm not trying to devalue that um but i would say if you were looking at them as uh credits to their to their world like if you're looking at the rhythm game genre for example 
I would always point to Rock Band first. I would always point to Rock Band and say, I think there's more value in that product than there is in, in Guitar Hero. If you if you had to pick one, that's the one I would always go for. Um, and I think a better example of these, um, which, as I say that out loud, I wonder, why didn't I lead with that? I just hit record. We're just going for it. Um, is Skate. Now, the Skate series, um, I'm going to just talk about video games, I think, mostly for this. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of movie and, and, and other media examples that you can think of um but with skate right so skate one full disclosure skate one, recently i did my top 50 games of all time uh i i well i did it in 2017 with a friend of mine we sat down and we went it was a big project we had a lot of free time on our hands apparently <laughs> um and skate came in at number six of all games i've played in my whole life six best one right and recently i went through it again i was like oh i'm gonna check this list and i moved some around and i added in some new ones that i've played in the past few years skate didn't move skate stayed there skate is is an incredible achievement in my opinion it is not only is it innovative and interesting and fun but i think it is the single best representation of a subculture in all of video games i think it is a love letter in the truest sense um i don't think it it's a misuse of that phrase um uh, or an or an exaggeration i think i think it's genuinely uh i'm just i'll just say masterpiece why the fuck not um but Skate 3, as the series evolved, um, and as we look back, how many years now? I, can't, I don't even know when Skate 3 came out, but that, we're now two generations removed from that as of today, because the Xbox Series X came out today, I believe, or yesterday. Um, and Skate 3 is, I think, when those games come up, that's the one that is most fondly remembered. And now that might be down to the age of the people who played it when it came out. Um, I've, and, you know, as the type of people who would comment on, you know, Twitter threads and, and all these things saying like, oh, we want Skate 3. I played Skate 3 loads, right? But I think the Skate franchise is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating case study because... Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give some examples as to why I think Skate One is 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 a masterpiece, as as I said. Um, but I think to give some context, Skate One it came in when Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, which was a um, well established franchise at that time, that was based on fun, that was based on mainstream, accessible fun and over the top wacky uh, gameplay that anybody could pick up and play. Um, Skate came in and said, right, there was a niche in this market, there's a huge subculture here of um, of skaters and skate-adjacent cultures um, and, and people who just like the, those, those, uh, those worlds that aren't being represented uh, in the pretty much the one and only franchise at that time. There have been other examples of, of skating games in the past, but that Tony Hawk's is the one, right? But we want to do it where it's more realistic, it's more um, genuine, it's more of a modern example of of what skating is. Now, I want to preface this by saying, I don't think that realism, you know, more polygons, more higher res textures, more... Um, more realistic exa- uh I'm going to I'm going to circle back a little bit here just because your game is exaggerated or cartoony or or any of these things does not mean that it is automatically usurped by something that is realistic as a better example of uh representation of a subculture right so you could have a super cartoony uh 3D animated movie that is a better example of a subculture for example coco 
than something else that is quote unquote gritty, real, shot on the highest def cameras, uh, almost documentary like movie that just doesn't get the point of the subculture, right? Like it just misses the mark. It's just like it, it, it's not the right thing. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that we're talking about realistic representation of the aesthetics of a, of a subculture. What we're actually talking about is the heart of the subculture. Or why people are initially drawn to that subculture. Why that subculture came about in the first place. Because subcultures always come around when there is a, a hole, a, a gap in people feeling that they can authentically express themselves. That's where it, it comes from. Um, you know, they, they look at the cultures around them, they look at what is available to them, they look at the things that they like, they look at the aesthetics that they are inspired by, and they go, none of these things are really pulled together in a way that fully expresses myself, so we're going to do it for us. Every subculture has that has that background. It's Subcultures are there to define a culture that isn't represented. That's why it's called a subculture. And and you can look at every example like I'm going to I'm going to actually just quickly pull up one. Uh doo -doo -doo, let's get rid of that. And let's pull this back up. Subcultures egg, examples. Let's go with that, right? Um Nope, this is Wikipedia. List of, uh, uh, put this one earlier. Any of these ones, cosplay, goth, hip hop, otaku, metalcore, internet subculture. Um, internet subculture, I mean, is a, is a solid example of uh, people who had access to this new technology. Um, but they they didn't necessarily feel like um the usual spaces for things were catering to to their interests and so they they were granted this space and infinite possibilities and they went all right cool well we're just going to we're going to connect in a completely new way and we're going to completely make this new identity for ourselves um bodybuilding is up there if you make a movie about bodybuilding, like Pain and Gain, um, or you know the documentary about uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you just make it entirely about um, competition, right? If you just make it about who wins, who loses, you know he 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 built more body than the other guy. Is that an honest representation of what it was that drew people who? who saw these spaces and thought that's for me that's something i want to do like why is it that they wanted to do that my guess and i don't know this honestly but my guess would be that it's about self-improvement it's about uh wanting to look a certain way but wanting to feel like they have some kind of a like control or they, they want to express themselves through the hard work that they put in, they put in, you know, literal blood, sweat, and tears, and come out the other way, feeling completely empowered. Um, and I think, I think a lot of subcultures are are that, you know, like a lot of subcultures about pulling together a combination of aesthetics and and uh, self improvement and self empowerment and connecting with other people. Uh, for that same purpose um, so with I feel like I'm probably waffling quite a bit and I'm probably circling a lot of different drains at one time so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back in skate one has uh, the entire purpose of that game is about celebrating skating as an activity skating as a route of self-improvement skating as a route of uh self-expression and i think that the way it does that so many different ways so with the the visual style it's all very grungy it's all very 
um, haphazard DIY thrown together, labels peeling off and brickwork falling apart, and and the you know they've built that into the visual style with the UI and the aesthetics and uh, and the menus and everything, but the core of the the gameplay is rooted in self improvement, is rooted in try and try again, fall over, get back up, start again, fall over, get back, repeat, 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 until you get it right. And and until you get it right isn't necessarily defined by the game's parameters. A lot of the game is defined by your parameters. It's defined by, you can set up a certain spot and you can look at a ledge and you can go, I want to do this particular trick, grind it here, come off of there and get it from this angle. Um, And if I can do that, awesome that is that is uh what i want out of this experience at this moment and the game doesn't the game doesn't get in your way to do that in fact it actually makes it easier for you to do it it lets you drop yourself at a certain point and save that point so that you can get up and try again as get up and try again and keep doing that and doing that over and over and anybody with experience with with skating can tell you that that is what that is it's skating is falling down and getting back up and trying it again and keep doing it doing it doing it polishing it understanding it getting better at it until you nail it and when you nail it everyone around you celebrates that and when you nail it that that's the moment of the 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 rush that you uh, that you get when you when you meet your self uh self-prescribed goal is the whole point of everything you watch any skate footage uh, parks or competitions that's what that is bales falling like falling over uh, falling off your skateboard is literally built into like the video packages that people put out like guys in the in the, the 80s and 90s would film themselves doing certain tricks you know cutting compilation style they would go out with some friends, they'd film a certain spot, they would either nail the spot or they would fall over and they would try it again and keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And they don't just nail the spot in the in the video, they'll usually include a lot of the 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 work that went into getting to that. And it's it that's what it's about. It's about failing and trying again and not letting uh failure get in the way of what it is that you want to do. And not what anybody else has told you to do. It's not like you know, you're going for like a world record where you have a certain number that you have to reach. And then once you've reached that, boom, you've succeeded. You have decided exactly what it is that you want to do. And it's about control and it's about self-improvement and it's about working outside the parameters of the world around you and making the world around you work for you. You use the spaces that you're given and you do whatever the hell it is that you want to do. And that's the whole point of it. And it's the freedom of it. It's the control of it. It's the empowerment of it. It's the communal aspect of it. Um, I, 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 I'm lovingly expressing why I think skating subculture is is so good and so important for for a lot of people. But I think, if we're honest, this is the same for every subculture. And I'm sure there's some examples that you know might have some negatives to them. I'm sure every subculture has negatives to them. Um, so you know, if there's some examples and you want to hit up the comments with. I don't. I wouldn't talk so lovingly about this subculture. I, I'm not here to to review subcultures to critique. Uh, you know which ones. I'm not doing a tier list here. It's it's um it's about understanding the psychology of it and understanding why people are drawn to these these areas and how media represents them honestly and authentically. Um, and you know if you take skate one and everything that i just said about skating the world design is specifically for uh for that freedom of expression the camera uh is you know reflecting the kind of cameras that people use when they're doing these things but then also it gives you the opportunity to do all these self-expression with you know taking your own videos setting up your own shots setting up your photo shoot um it makes it very easy to if you don't do it right the first time you just hit a button and you can just try it again and it, it's streamlined for that level of um that that cycle and for that level of self-expression comparatively where the franchise moved to with a bigger audience and more polish and more more resources and more money is by skate three you're doing things that people were doing in tony hawks where you're jumping off of buildings 
to crash to the ground to break some bones and get the highest points and the person with the highest points wins the game this isn't inherently a bad thing right because that game is fun as hell i love skate 3 it's really fun but it isn't in my top 50 games of all time not even close and i think what pushed me away from that series was this move to um making a product that doesn't necessarily have the same vision that the first one did where i was drawn to the authenticity i was drawn to the the realness of it and i was drawn to the honesty of it and i loved that about it i think that i think that's why that game succeeds so well skate 3 succeeds but in a completely different way um and you ask two different people and they'll give you two different reasons as to which one they want the new skate that is on the way that we we got confirmed which one they would rather that they emulate um so it could go either way you know it could it could try to uh bring that fun back to people who wanted the third one or bring that honesty back that i liked in the first one um uh maybe it can try and do all of them to different levels of success i don't know um but i think to give this video a, a kind of a rounding round rounding a corner to a point um if you're critiquing media that is specifically about representing something um like a like culture i think you have to ask these questions about authenticity not just in the media itself but in yourself as well um and you have to be completely honest with with that process and you have to be completely honest with yourself and your biases your gaps in knowledge um but then also looking at the media itself question whether it's representing the heart and the mind of a subculture or is it just representing the aesthetics of it um and is that enough is that uh is that really a success so uh, to give some examples off the top of my head of ones that I think are uh, more more great examples because I think I only really talked about the harmonics games and the, the skate games uh, versus you know Tony Hawk's and Guitar Hero. Um, Spider Verse represents uh, in in the opening sequence where you see Miles Moranis in his house where he has a um, Latino or Latin Latin. Uh, parent on one side and a black parent on the other side and um in those moments you can watch a breakdown of that sequence and see how the cultures have kind of fed into the little artistic decisions that they've made the way characters talk the way they move the way they represent themselves um and how that influences miles um we've seen some examples of it in the uh in the new game that's just come out um in the way that people are celebrating the fact that puerto rican uh, culture is represented in that game um is is it enough to put a flag up because i've seen some videos of some puerto ricans who reacting to that uh that footage and f- being overwhelmed with emotion at just seeing uh the the flag it, because it's so rarely represented in in uh in in media and particularly in video games right like diversity and representation in video games are only just starting to get like people arguing over whether or not you know having like can you have too many queer characters in in last of us part two that's a whole video in and of itself um they're wrong by the way last of us two is yeah anyway so is, is it enough to throw up some flags and say look at the representation look at the the subculture celebrated or do you have to have people around your team in your team making decisions making creative informed decisions about that subculture about that culture um that have that that background because if you don't have that if you're genuinely honest if you just have a team full of of white people making decisions about a culture that is predominantly latin then how authentic is it and how authentic do you want it to be and then when you come out with your product and then you know the market is just like look at 
celebrating this and that and it's like but how honest are we here um because you know it's it's one thing to uh throw in references but it's another thing to give vindication to the people who saw themselves not represented who saw themselves not empowered who saw themselves not feeling like they were being their authentic selves shown in the things that they watch and the media that they that they that they consume with the same insecurities and the same methods and desires of of uh of of expression and empowerment um and I think, uh, you know, Spider-Verse does it, I think, very well, I thought. I don't have those backgrounds. I would have to, you know, speak with people or read the the reviews from people who have those backgrounds at how well these things uh, leak into that product. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, there was a lot of... Uh, stand-up comedians who really thought that um the oh god what was it called the big sleep apparently that had like really really great um kind of insight and it, you know it was written by a stand-up comedian so it, of course it, it's got a certain insight whereas if you make a film about, <laughs> about a stand-up comedian without having ever done an open mic or spoken with open micers or or spent time in in green rooms and locker rooms then then is that world that of of you know uh the seller you know the, like new york uh it, are you are you just taking some of the aesthetics that you've seen from other products like you watched an episode of louis and you went all oh, right yeah cool that's cool yeah cool right we'll just make everything look like that or are they talking in a, in a uh, using their language using their way of expression using that style of communication that those people in that world have um and i think that stuff is incredibly important um do you have to spend a million years researching this because you could research this stuff to the ends of the earth but you know i i think it's i think ultimately it's important to just be honest about honesty to be authentic about authenticity um and uh and make creative decisions uh, with the resources that you have um, that try their best uh, yeah and if you're watching something or playing something and these kind of thoughts enter your mind maybe just have a think about checking out some of the other uh, representations of that culture and seeing how they how they mash together how they they fit together or where they fight where they uh, they clash so yeah a uh, bit of a different video. Uh, I apologies if you don't give a shit about looking at my face and hearing me waffle on about stuff that enters my brain. But you know what? I feel like uh, I would rather be making stuff than not making stuff, and this was just something I wanted to make. So here we are, uh, thirty-eight minutes later. I would really like to do another video on uh, some amusement park stuff. Um, so if you have any particular if, if that was the reason why you're here, uh, send me some ideas for some other ones to do. I've got a million that I want to get to, but um, to be honest, I get a little bit of that paralysis where I'm just like, oh, there's too many choices. I didn't do one for Halloween. I should have done some scary ones for Halloween. Um, I had some lined up, but I just never got to it. Uh, I got that awful paralysis feeling. So uh, yeah, send me some stuff that you want to hear. And uh, thanks for coming, hanging out for 40 minutes. And uh, I guess I'll see you next time I get the the bug, the bite to do this again. Cheers. Bye.